just wait. Uh, we're just doing the motivation. But, uh, <coughs> Try to generate correct motivation. So think that we are here together for a particular purpose, and that's to understand uh, compassion and ultimate reality. And for that purpose, we can motivate ourselves to uh, yeah, to generate good intentions for self and others in order to transform the mind and well in the direction of wanting to accomplish more happiness for self and others and try to generate the motivation. Or you can think about. Uh, Precious human rebirth, liberation, and enlightenment. Yes. Try to <coughs> generate great motivation. And then we start with some prayers on page number 73 of the prayer book. Sakyamuni Buddha in front and surrounding you are the sentient beings with six realms experiencing individual suffering and I think you lead them in the prayer to uh, liberation and enlightenment. 70, 73. Yeah, 73. To the founder, thou transcend destroy the one gone beyond, the food destroy, the complete perfect food way can be, perfect in knowledge and good conduct. Sagata so over the world, supreme so guide of human beings to be taken. Teacher of gods and human beings, to you the complete and full awakened one, the down transcend and destroy the glorious conqueror, the subdue from the sacred claim, and prostrate my offerings of refuge. To the founder, down transcend and destroy the one gone beyond, the full destroyer, the complete, perfect, full awakened being, perfect in knowledge and good conduct, God and over the world, so being the guide of human beings to be tamed. Teacher of gods and human beings, to you the complete and full awakened one, the down transcend and destroy the glorious conqueror, the subdue from the sacred claim, and prostrate my offerings. To the founder, down transcend and destroy the one gone beyond, before destroying the complete, perfect, full awakened being, perfect in knowledge and good conduct. As a guide and over the worlds, being guided human beings to be tamed. Teacher of gods, human beings, to you the complete, full awakened one. To down transcend and destroy the glorious conqueror, the subdue from the sake clan, and prostrate make offerings of the refuse. When you supreme amongst humans, you were born on this earth, you played out in seven strides, and then sent down supreme in this world. To you, O wise then, I prostrate. A pure body is formed supremely pure, risen ocean like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, rim of the vast Lord to your prostrate. The spring signs face like a spotless moon, colour like gold to your prostrate. Thus free like you, the three worlds are not incomparable wise one to your prostrate. The Saviour have a great compassion, the founding have no understanding, filled with merit and quality like a vast ocean. To you the one gone to dust and prostrate. The purity that frees from attachment, the virtue that frees from the low arms. The one part sublime pure reality, the Dharma that pacifies the prostrate. Those who are liberated also show the part of liberation, the holy field qualified for realizations. Or devoted to the moral precepts, to you sublime community, intending virtue and prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three every Lord homage. To all worldly or respects, bounded bodies, as many as all realms and all. Specs with supreme fate are paying homage. Do not commit any more virtuous actions. Perform only perfect virtuous actions. So do your mind thoroughly. This is the teachings of the Buddha. A star, a visible oblation, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop or a blue or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning and clouds, see conditioned things as such. To this merit, may all sentient beings obtain the rank of all seeds, subdue the full faults, and deliver the fruits of time and ocean, burned by the waves of Asian seas and cats. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem, thus did I heard at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on the Mars Virgin's mountain, and I stood together with a great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At a time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in concentration on the character of the phenomenon called Fangkash. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya, Arya looked upon the very practice of profound perfection of wisdom, and beheld those anchors also as ancient nature. Then, to the power of the Buddha, the Venkasharya Putra, said to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Bhutanisvara, How should any son of the village who trained to wish to practice activities of the foundation of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Bhutanisvara said to the Venkasharya Putra, Shari Putra, any son of the village or daughter of the village who wishes to practice activities of the foundation of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeating, go all those five eggs also sentient by nature. 
Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is other than form, and form is also not than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, composition of factors, and questions are empty. Shariputra likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristics. Unproduced, unseen, stainless, without staining of the fluid. Shariputra, therefore, emptiness is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no composition of factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visible form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, no phenomenon. There is no element, and not to include no mind element, and no mental consciousness. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, not to include no aging and death, no extinction of aging and death. Similar, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and part. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas will lie and dwell in affection and wisdom. The mind without obscuration and without fear. Have a completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of Nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the two times also manifest a complete awakening to unsurpassed perfect, complete life, no lies on perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to an equal. The mantra that only pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is declared Tayata, Gadagata, Paragata, Parasamgata, Bodhisattva. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the found perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Abhilakus Vada, saying, Well said, well said, son of the village, it is like that, it is like that. When you practice the found perfection of wisdom, just have you indicated it. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having this spoken, the Venkva Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Abhilakus Vada, those surrounding there entirely, along with the gods and gods, humans and surahs, are overjoyed and highly praised for what I hope. I prostrate to the gathering of the Dakinis of the three chakras who abide in the holy yoga using space. And the power of their voice emanates an illumination loop and the partition like not for the chakra. By the teachings of the three sublime jewels possess the power of truths, may the inner and outer needs be transformed. May they be dispelled, may they be pacified. May all native forces opposed to the Dharma be completely pacified, and may their hosts of 80,000 obstacles be pacified. And may they be separated from the problems and harmful conditions to the Dharma, and may the enjoyments go into the Dharma, and may there be suspicious happiness here and right now. And we do a short share. Thank you. Foundation of Open Qualities, 93. Page 93. The Foundation of Open Qualities is the kind of perfect guru. Correctly devoted to him is the root of the part. I clean seeing this and applying great effort. Please bless me to rely on my great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once is greatly meaningful and difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that conceives me day and night takes lessons. This life is impermanent as a water bubble, remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like shadow that follows the body, the reason of black and white comes follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all future deeds. Seeking some side pleasures is go to all suffering, they are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognize these short comments, please bless me to wish for liberation. Led by the spirit taught mindfulness, alertness and precaution rise. The root of the teaching is keeping the parching of your vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so all modern migratory beings. Please bless me to see this train as supreme bodhicitta and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but do not practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I practice the person to the wrong objects and correctly analyze the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly with my mind stream the unified part of karma body and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general part, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme body of equal. At a time, the basis of accomplishing two attainments is keeping pure vows as a minor. 
as I come firmly convinced of this, please bless me to collect these blessings from my life. Then having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajra, by practicing with great energy and having done the four sessions. Please bless me to realize the teaching of the Guru. Like that, it's made words which have no parts, which still depends on the Guru. Please bless me to bless my complete heart and my innocence. In all my life, I have been proud of this good Guru, and I have joined my lips and down. I completely the quality of the stages and parts made for the taking state of Vajra. Short Mandala, next page, 98. <laughs> So, um, courageous compassion and ultimate reality. That's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so, yesterday we uh, did the introduction um, uh, to that. So, yesterday what we talked about to, to, yeah, to review that a little bit. So, compassion is the mind that wishes essentially beings to be free of suffering. Yeah? So, yesterday we talked about different types of compassion. So, one type of compassion is how wonderful it be if all sentient beings be free from suffering, right? May they be free of suffering. And I will cause them to be free of suffering. Yeah, we went uh, yesterday over those three aspects. Because, uh, yeah, that's the definition of compassion. And the definition of love and kindness is how wonderful it be if all sentient beings always abide in happiness. May they abide in happiness, and I will cause them to abide in happiness. You know, so, um, that's two things, compassion and love and kindness. Yeah? So, there, why are those two uh, yeah, aspects so important? Because we have two aims in life, that is wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. Yeah? So, all sentient beings in that regard are exactly the same. Yeah, so, uh, everybody of us wants to have happiness and don't like suffering. It's a very innate wish, so to say. Yeah. So we went over that yesterday a little bit. And that's, yeah, things in ordinary life, the external kind of uh, things around us, they don't give really the ultimate satisfaction, as we discussed yesterday. Yeah, so, uh, the mind, is basically depends on the mind, right? Samsara and Nirvana depends on the mind. Happiness and suffering depends on the mind. Yeah. So in that regard, you have to train the mind in order to uh, accomplish those aims in life. So in order to accomplish those aims in life, the Buddha also saw that as an important aspect of people experiencing suffering, but they don't like suffering, and people like happiness. Right? So the Buddha, uh, because of that, he generated this kind of things like compassion and love and kindness. Right? Compassion the wish to be free of suffering and love for kindness, the wish to abide in happiness. So, 
the Buddha on the spiritual box came to those conclusions and also saw what is the cause for suffering and what is the cause for happiness. Yeah, so, um, as we discussed yesterday, that uh, in order to understand all sentient beings to be free of suffering, we have to generate a kind of understanding what suffering is all about. Right? So without understanding suffering yourself, you cannot generate a wish for others to be free of suffering. Yeah? So uh, that's very essential to understand suffering yourself. So yesterday we discussed the all pervasive compounding form of suffering. Meaning, when the Buddha said you should know suffering, the first noble truth, right? you should know suffering, his first teaching. Second noble truth, you should abandon the cause of suffering. And the third noble truth, you should manifest it through cessation. And the fourth noble truth is, you know, you should meditate on the true paths. And so that summarizes the four noble truths. And then when the Buddha said you should know suffering, as we saw yesterday, is not the suffering of suffering or the suffering of change. Yeah, that's for us very easy to recognize when we have a cold or a headache or mental some difficulties. It's very easy to recognize. Yeah. But the Buddha said you should know a more sophisticated aspect of the problems in life. Right? So then he pointed down that you know the all pervasive compounding form of suffering. You know, meaning all pervasive meaning wherever you are within samsara or wherever in your body from the tip of your toes to the crown of your head underneath the surface there's also a possibility to get pain or to have a particular sickness right so when sickness or pain doesn't it's not beyond our control it just happens to us yeah, so it happens to us by the power of karma and afflictions so as long as we have karma and afflictions we have to undergo suffering right so that's the conclusion more or less. So then this all-pervasive compounding aspect of suffering talks about as long as we have these aspects of karma and afflictions, we have a possibility to suffer. And so that's what the Buddha talked about and what we talked about yesterday. And then the even more sophisticated aspect to karma and afflictions is the root cause of suffering. Direct cause of suffering are our destructive emotions like anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, aversion, things of, you know, uh, anxiety, fear, you know, those kind of aspects are, so to say, the yeah, direct cause of suffering. When the mind gets disturbed by an irritation or something like that, it propels us to do all kind of behavior things like physically or verbally. You know, we can say something wrong to an individual because of our irritation. You know. So then for a few minutes, of irritation can actually destroy hours of our peace of mind for the day. Yeah, so as we saw yesterday. So uh, that's the direct cause of suffering is the destructive emotions, anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, anxiety, fear, those kind of uh, yeah, destructive emotions cause directly the particular suffering. Yeah. But the root cause of all suffering is a kind of grasping to concrete I am mine as we saw yesterday also, a uh, kind of self-centeredness, right, that is based upon seeing or thinking we exist very concrete from our own side. When we get angry at a person or strong attachment arises, it's a very strong appearance of a self that looks, that looks like it appears in a particular way without dependence, all by itself. Yeah, so in a similar way, external objects like the table, like the walls, like the building, appears out there without dependence. But if you analyze, everything is in the nature of interdependence, right? Our body, our mind is in the process of momentary change, is in the process of depending on many causes and conditions. And the same is true for the building around us, yes? It looks very concrete out there, but it came into being by the power of causes and conditions. So, coming into being by the power of causes and conditions, uh, that we normally don't really see. Yeah? So it just appears to us very concrete. So, uh, the way it appears, it doesn't exist in that way. Yeah? It doesn't exist the way it appears. So, that's something to be examined yeah? in order to understand uh, 
this ignorance, you know, to understand this aspect of uh, you know, what actually is the real root cause of suffering, uh, that, yeah, that concrete concept of I and mine that arises just before an affliction arises becomes very kind of present or manifest. You know? Ah, how dare this person say this to me? I'm more important. You know? Or I need this, I need that. You know, it's a lot of a strong concept of I and mine. So that's actually the. <laughs> we saw yesterday evening that if you examine it, doesn't exist, but we think it exists. And that causes the problem. Yeah. So, in a similar way, also the destructive emotions, as we saw yesterday, they, yeah, they appear in a particular way that we believe it's reality. You know? But uh, if you examine, then you will see it's slightly different. Yeah. So, with destructive emotions, same thing. Uh, as we saw yesterday, of attachment, you have the object of attachment has maybe 60% qualities and 40% uh, kind of. Faults, but those 40% we don't like to see with object of attachment, right? We only see 90% qualities, which is not present in the object of attachment, right? It's only 60% or something like that. But we mentally fabricate aspects of this object which are not there. So that means our object of attachment, yeah, when we overestimate the qualities of that object, we will never meet that particular uh, kind of object in that way. It's not reality. Right? So that means that when we meet an object of attachment, there's no satisfaction because we don't meet all those qualities we mentally imputed, we mentally fabricated. Yeah? So, uh, yeah. so that means our mind is not in concert with reality. So yesterday we also talked about, <laughs> we talked about uh, anger, same thing. Yeah? So, the object of anger or our object of aversion, so to say, has maybe 60% faults and 40% qualities, but we don't like to see those 40% qualities. We only fo focus on the faults, right? So that's why it's also not in contrary with reality. So many aspects of our daily life are not in contrary with reality, and that's why it's a problem. Same yesterday, one question regarding uh, debt and impermanence, yeah, also. Because we don't like to think about debt and impermanence, so because of that, uh, yeah, we, we don't prepare our mind. And then when something happens, a family member or a dear friend passes away, or you have to self, you have to die, then there's a problem. It's very difficult. So uh, if you prepare your mind and reflect upon this aspect of reality, yeah, that and impermanence, and there's much more acceptance when it happens. So in Europe, in the early days, uh, there was always put in a corner. You don't talk about that and impermanence, right? Because it's not nice to talk about. <laughs> but uh, now, uh, luckily, they came to the conclusion that it's good to talk about it. So they have this kind of movement which is called the Dead Cafe. Yeah, so it's a very, it started in the UK, I think. But now it's spread all over, luckily. So elderly people, they meet together, people who lose a person in life, and they discuss things to talk about it. Right? So if you understand that aspect of reality, because we go and die, if, they, if you're born, one day you're going to die, right? So that's, that's, you cannot prevent that from coming into being. But if you always put it in the corner, then when we meet it, it's very difficult. If you understand this on a regular basis, then when you meet it, it's not that difficult issue to deal with. You know, even from a Buddhist perspective, because consciousness is separate from the brain, right? Consciousness depends on the brain. There's a correlation between states of mind and, and brain activity, as we discussed yesterday. Yeah, so uh, there are many relationships being examined in, in different fields of cognitive science, neuroscience. Yeah, so yesterday we talked about things like the Olympic meditators. Yeah, so meaning if you accomplish certain amount of experience in meditation, then those people, they produce a kind of gamma waves which was never measured before right, in the human brain. So that proves there's a possibility with mental development which goes beyond the physical. Yeah, so every four years there's only the world record of 
normal Olympics is just with a few split seconds is being uh, broken, right? So that's that's it. But with mental development, there's no basically there's no kind of limit. If you all the way go up to a uh, generation of enlightenment, you know, then development of the mind is beyond imagination. So that's why these Olympic meditators, so they say, they produce brain activity was never measured before in the human brain. So that's quite interesting. You know? So so that means we can develop the mind. And that's uh, by the power of understanding reality. And then there's no grasping too much to uh, destructive emotions anymore. Because if you understand reality well, even on a day-to-day -day basis, if you understand reality well, then all these fears for death and impermanence or never meeting the objects you like to meet or meeting the things you dislike starts to make more sense by understanding the concepts of samsara. Yeah, so uh, for that purpose we have to understand, as the Buddha said, you should know suffering. So then referring to the obvious compounding form of suffering or karma and afflictions. Yeah. And the root cause of karma and afflictions is this ignorance. Yeah, so there's two aspects there. So if you understand this ignorance of the I and mine, that appears very concrete from its own side, but when you look in your body and in your mind, there's no place where this fits in. You know, even your body, from the tip of your toes to the crown of your head, or the different parts of your body, or the different processes within your body, there's no place for something that exists all by itself. Right? So it appears, the eye appears very concrete existing from its own side, so when affliction comes up, or we're close to dead, or somebody criticizes us, right? very concrete, a sense of I that appears. But if you look, there's nothing like that in the body, right? If you look at a TV, uh, a TV or a YouTube kind of presentations of, uh, you know, people operate, you know, you can see inside the body. So, <laughs> so you can imagine how it looks like beyond, behind the skin. You know? So if you just check in your own body and you see the heart going, the lungs moving and the food being digested. And so in that whole process, you cannot really find something existing concrete all by itself. What appears to be the self, what appears to be a concrete I am I. Right? So it is not there. Then also in the mind, you can check. And also in the mind, you can check that actually it's not there. You know, it's, it's, there's just a flux of different thoughts, of patterns that goes, comes and goes. Right? So, in that aspect of, of consciousness, also there's no place to, to be found. Kind of concrete from its own side exists I am mine. It appears, right? It appears when we get angry or something, it appears very concrete. But uh, if you analyze, actually you cannot find it. You see? So that is kind of, if you see you cannot find it, meaning it's empty of concrete existence. It's empty of existing from its own side. You know, so that's when we talk about emptiness in the Buddhist doctrine, when we talk about emptiness, it's not nothingness. Yeah, so sunyata doesn't mean nothingness. Sunyata means empty of something. Yeah, so empty of what? Empty of concrete existence, empty of inherent existence. Yeah, so that's the root cause of the problems. Yeah, because uh, that solves the root cause of the problems. If you understand this lack of concrete existence, this emptiness of sunyata, if you understand that well, then you will see that there is no concrete aspect of reality as it appears. But if you check, you cannot find that concrete reality. Yeah? So not being able to find it is called emptiness. So empty of something, yeah? so also the center, which looks now much brighter than a few months ago when they gave me first last time, <laughs> with the ceiling being painted and new windows, and yeah, it's quite an amazing kind of uh, place now. And it looks like twice as big, but it's the same. The appearance is like that. You know? It's not. It's the same, you know, kind of uh, wall, but it looks more spacious. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. So whatever appears is not always reality. That's one. Thing. So you have to understand. That. So yesterday we also saw with a dream that the person who swallowed the ring, uh, because in the dream she thought she was being robbed in the train, so she took out the ring, swallowed. And in the dream, she believed <laughs> so much that uh, that was reality. So 
for them. So we woke up in the morning, didn't see the ring, and then remembered the dream, and then <laughs> went to the hospital and made photographs and was in the stomach. Yeah. So <laughs> it's very interesting uh, that sometimes we believe things to be true, but it's not. Yeah? So, <laughs> so that is, uh, yeah, in this case, kind of, yeah. Uh, so it teaches us to see that whatever appears is not reality. So that's something to be examined. Um, and then seeing that this is the root cause of suffering, if you understand that because of these building blocks of concrete, I am mine, yeah, afflictions arise. So if you see that these concrete building blocks actually don't exist the way it appears, then uh, the afflictions will lose their grasp, or they will lose their potential to, to build up. You know? So because when we get irritated with a person is I and person are two complete uh, things existing from its own side. Right? So I I don't like this person because of this, this, this. But the person we dislike right, can be a friend of somebody else. So we say enemy, somebody else says friend. Somebody else on the street says, oh stranger. Right? But this person A, we call it that person A, is not from its own side existing enemy, or from its own side existing friend, or from its own side existing stranger. It depends on how we see them, right? You see that? Yeah. So, uh, so the difference is from the point of view of the observer, not from the point of view of the object. And so a similar thing you see in quantum mechanics, that what the observer observes depends also on the observer, not only from the point of view of the object. You see that? So things don't exist all from their own sight. It is there's a kind of dependence between observer and object, right? So the same here, the same is here true. So within that context of interdependence, there is no place for things to exist all by themselves from their own sight, right? So that's that's something not uncommon to the Buddhist teaching, even in quantum mechanics. They come to similar conclusions, right? So that means that we really get a clear picture of what is actually the cause or the root cause for the destructive emotions to come about is this concrete concept of I and mine. If we think there is an I or a self that exists from its own side without dependence, that's how it appears, right? So that's how it appears, but the question is does it exist the way it appears? Right, that's the question. So there's many reasons we use independent origination to check if it exists or not. Right? So if things exist, then it should be in the nature of dependent origination. Right? Because our body and mind are in the nature of dependent origination from the point of view of cause and effects. Right? So within this process of cause and effect relationships, there's no place for something to exist without dependence. You see that? So within body and mind, there's no place for an eye to exist all by itself, from its own side. Yeah, so that's one important conclusion. Then the next level to be examined is that if you look from the point of view of dependence from parts and collection of parts, right? so within uh, our body, we have different parts of the body and we have the collection of it. Right? So, Within this dependence of parts and individual parts and a collection of those parts, within that dependence also there we cannot find something existing uh, all by itself without dependence. You know? So nothing, it's nothing present, so to say, separate from this interaction. Same thing if you look at the quantum level, there's no from its own side existing electrons or neutrons or whatever subatomic particle you classify. Yeah, there's nothing separate. The relationship between those individual particles is more important than the individual particles. They don't exist all by themselves. Neither is there something existing as a completion of it that exists all by itself without dependence. Right? So the same for us. If you look among the different parts and collection of parts, there is nothing that exists from its own side. You see that? Right? So that's, that's another level of dependent origination. And the, the third level of dependent origination 
is then done off. Things are merely imputed by the mind. Okay? So what we say when you were born, is somebody gave you a name, right? Or certain time you get a name and then you see that name existing for its own sight. So for me it was Tenzin Namdak. <laughs> but uh, if you look for Tenzin Namdak, where is he? It's, I cannot find in, in my body and in my mind, right? So it's just merely imputed aspect. Also, a prime minister or a president, just before he or she comes into being, there's no prime minister or president. But then, after just after they come into being, then it's a very concrete from its own side existing. President or prime minister, right there. Right? So it looks very concrete, but actually it's just a label. It's just a mental fabrication of making a distinction, how you call it. Yeah. Same with a car, you know, if you have a car, the car actually is not the individual parts. It's not the collection of it, right? If you check, if you take, assemble all the different aspects of the, of the car, right? The wheels you take off, the motor you take, you take everything out and then you pile them up in a pile, you know, of individual parts. It's not a car, but all the parts are there, right? So it only has to be assembled in a particular way, in order to label, oh, this is what we call, consider a car, right? So same for our body and minds, based on the mere collection of the aggregations or the aggregates, in a particular way, we classify that as a body, right? You see that? Yeah, so that means mere imputation by the mind. Yeah, so if you understand that this ignorance is the cause, the root cause for the problems of generating anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, you know, so, they also see that this, it appears in a particular way, but we also saw whatever appears is not always reality, right? So, you have to examine, so you can see that how it appears, that's the first, the first kind of step. If we know how it appears, then we start to analyze, does it exist the way it appears, right? Because we know whatever appears is not reality, yeah, so we have to analyze that, so you check how does it appear? So when somebody gets angry at you or criticizes you, it's a very precious opportunity to see how does it appear. Very concrete from some side. So that's, you have to get a clear picture of. Then if you have a clear picture of that, then you hold it with the mind. And with the other part of the mind, you start looking if it's you know, within the body or within the mind or separate from body and mind, you see. So the way to do that is, if you walk around in, in city with your phone, <laughs> as most people do these days, so then you have a map, right? You're capable of <laughs> looking at the map and looking at the road at the same time. You can do that as human beings, right? So <laughs> in a similar way, you try to check how the eye appears, and then you start to analyze if it's the one or different from body and mind, right? So if it's one, then it should be many because there's many parts of the body, right? But it appears to be one. How the eye appears is a kind of uh, is a kind of entity all by itself. When you get angry at a person, it's like the eye appears so concrete, you know. So it appears to be one, but if it's one with the body, it should be many because you have many parts, right? Right? So that means actually it cannot be one with the body. That's, that's one kind of uh, reason. Yeah. So the first, uh, that's the first, that's one reason. And then the second one is, oh, maybe it's different from the body. Right? So if you try to isolate the eye, how it appears, different from the body, then uh, there's, no, there's no concept of the body anymore. There's no I, my body, my this, my that. So that means it's not separate, inherently separate from the body. See that? So with the mind you do the same thing, you know, you, you check if, it's, if it exists, if it's one with the mind. But the mind has many moments, the mind has coarser and subtle kind of aspects. Within that fluctuation of different moments, we can also not find an eye. And if the eye is one with all those moments, also it should be many, but it appears to be one. You see that? So also that cannot be the case. So then you think, oh, maybe separate from the mind, but then there's no kind of kasa. Uh, there's no, because we say my mind, mind this, mind that, so it cannot be inherently separate. You see that? So that's, uh, 
in a very <laughs> brief summary, I just summarized in half an hour four years of study, you know, because <laughs> we studied my Yamika for four years. So, actually, to, to make the outline a bit more clear for you, yeah, so we have an issue which is ignorance, right? So, ignorance is the cause for destructive emotions to arise. That's the first conclusion we have to get. Because, why is that true? Because ignorance is this kind of concrete concept of I am I. It looks like that the self exists without dependence or by itself, as an entity, you know, like a controller. Kind of. That's the first step we have to recognize. Yeah. So then, from the point of view of uh, reasoning, we have two reasons. Yeah. So you can put, put down if you want to make notes. Two reasons. Yeah. So the first one is the reason of dependent origination. Right? So that's the first proof that the I doesn't exist the way it appears. Yeah? So they we prove that with a reason called dependent origination. Yeah? So it has two terms, dependent and origination. So dependent means means it's not nothingness. Because and it's not things exist from their own side. Yeah, so if you say things are dependent, that means things cannot exist from their own side. Right? So with the proof of the first syllable, right, dependent origination, the first aspect, dependent, we know that things cannot exist from their own side. Right? That's the first proof. So uh, that yeah, prevents you from falling into the extreme of eternalism, that things exist all by themselves without dependence. You know? So if you have this first aspect of dependence, you don't fall to in that extreme that things exist from some side. So because things are independent. So independent means dependent on something else than itself. For example, a seed that grows into a plant depends on many causes and conditions to, to grow, right? So everything you, you can think of depends on something else than itself. Right? So that means things cannot exist all by themselves without dependence. You see that? That's the first one, yeah? dependent. Origination proves that conventionally things exist. Right? So that means that it's not emptiness is not nothingness. Emptiness is not nihilism. Right? Yeah? So that emptiness, shunyata, means empty of something. So that proves by this dependent origination, so dependent cuts this concrete aspect of reality. Well, origination cuts nothingness, right? So because conventionally things exist, conventionally things originate. Conventionally we have a body, we have a mind, right? So conventionally things exist, yeah, so that's dependent. Origination, yeah, so then this dependent origination has three levels yeah, of more coarser form and more subtler one. We already uh, talked about it, but to give you the summary in, in, in an outline. The first one, the level of dependent origination is causes and conditions. Things are in the nature of causes and conditions. The first level. That's a quite not that difficult to be understood kind of reality, right? That our body and mind are momentary changing. Yeah. We hear something outside, that's why we think about something. You know, so it's kind of cause and effect relationships. We put food in our, <laughs> we put in the morning masala dosa or whatever we put in, you know, so uh, the body also needs maybe masala dosa, is maybe not the most nutritious one, but <laughs> you put in breakfast and that, you know, get digested. And, uh, we need food to survive, right, so for the body, so same thing, it's kind of cause and effect relationships of the body, you know, and then with this kind of weather, then you can get a cold if you make sure, if you don't dress well and there's a cold wind and you know, a bit tired. It's easy to get a cold. So there's a lot of causes and conditions involved with our body, right? So that proves that this first level of dependent origination of causes and conditions that proves that things cannot exist from their own side because within the body and within the mind, same thing. Things are coming about by cause and conditions, right? So nothing can exist from its own side. So that's the first level of dependent origination. Yeah, easy, quite easy way. The second level of dependent origination is kind of individual parts and the collection of those individual parts. So our body, our mind, 
yeah, has this second level of dependent origination that we have individual parts and we have a collection of it. And that interdependence between the individual parts and the collection of it, there's nothing that exists from its own side. Right? So that means there is no place for something to exist from its own side within that dependent origination of parts and collection of the parts. So that's the second level of dependent origination. Then the third level of dependent origination is mere imputed by the mind. Yeah, I said before that the president, or we ourselves, you know, just merely imputed upon the mere collection of body and mind. You know? So there's a famous quotation in uh, yeah, many texts, uh, one text of Nagarjuna, uh, where it says, you know, uh, the egg, you not the aggregates, the aggregates are not you, and uh, you don't inherently possess the aggregate, ag aggregates, and the aggregates inherently don't depend on you, and you don't depend inherently on the aggregates. So, Tathagata, where are you? <laughs> you know, so, so as long as you use that quotation quite often, but then instead of Tathagata, where are you, you say your own name, where are you? So it's a very interesting kind of way to check that the I appears very concrete, but if you look, you're not the aggregates, the aggregates are not you, you're not separate, you're not one with, you don't inherently possess the aggregates, you don't, that you don't inherently depend upon the aggregates, neither do the aggregates inherently depend on you, because it's kind of, if you check, actually you cannot find. That's what Chandikirti, these things of dependent origination is, is kind of two reasons of the sevenfold reason of Chanda Kirti to see that the self doesn't exist the way it appears. Yeah, so another twofold kind of uh, thing we discussed is uh, so we have dependent origination, right? We went over to dependent origination and there's three levels. Yeah? Yeah. So is that clear? I mean clear in the sense of till like okay kind of thing. I do get it 100% clear that yeah, that's not going to happen in one weekend. I cannot promise that, that you will understand these levels within a weekend. You know, so that's not possible. Not even in a week or a month or a year. It's, it will take a little bit longer. Okay? So that's the first uh, reason. The other reason also we discussed briefly. Could you repeat that for again? Ah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, but if I repeat it and I don't have the correct <laughs> translation, then... Uh, yeah. uh, basically it says, uh, you know, the aggregates, in reference to the one and different kind of reason first, you not, the aggregates are not you, you not the aggregates, right? And you're not separated from the aggregates. Yeah, if you write them down, don't quote it, okay? Because I give you the real, the real translation later on. Uh, and you don't inherently possess the aggregates, right? The aggregates inherently don't depend on you, neither do you inherently depend on the aggregates. So where are you? Right? This kind of uh, free translation. Very free, free translation, <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> it's a very free translation of the actual quotation. Yeah, anyway. If you're interested, I'll give you the real quote later on. So, because that summarizes uh, this sevenfold reasoning of Chandakirti. Yeah, so, we went over our dependent origination, right? Yeah, so, it means the self doesn't inherently possess, oh, sorry, the self doesn't inherently depend upon the aggregates, neither does the, do the aggregates inherently depend upon the self. Because there's no inner independence, right? So that means things are in the nature of interdependence. And because of things are in the nature of dependence, there is no inner existence. Nothing exists on its own side, right? Yeah. But that's been proved by this threefold reasoning. Then, uh, then from the point of view of the next reason, so that's one reason, right? Yeah, depending on shit. So one point of view, the next one, one and different. That's another reason. Yeah, yeah, two. Yeah. So now the second one, one and different. So the one and different reasoning is being praised by many meditators. You know, and many of the Lombard texts, they, they praise this one and different. Why? Because it's a very sharp way of reasoning to cut the misunderstanding of the self. Right. So, how do you do that? First of all, again, you have to get a clear picture of how itself appears. Yeah. So then, instead of using your mind to look at a game or something and look around, 
Now you try to use your mind in a more constructive way, but the same technique applies. If you walk around in the city and you look at a map and you look at the road, yesterday I had a, uh, yeah, I went to somewhere in Whitefield and then also the driver had his map, but it was in, in Kanda language, so I didn't hear, but uh, that the driver to another direction instead of the real thing. But yeah, anyway, so you can imagine if you look at the map and you look at the road when you're walking, you know that you can do that, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so in the same way, we see how the eye appears when somebody gets irritates you, when you get angry, when attachment arises, when you're close to death, you know, almost dying, then the very concrete concept of I appears. So that's very important to recognize. Because because of that appearance, uh, we generate these destructive emotions. Right? So those destructive emotions, they use these building blocks of concrete existence. You know? So uh, you have to recognize that. And then you have to reason that it doesn't exist the way it appears, right? That's where you have to get to. So then you see how it appears, and you hold it with one aspect of the mind, like looking at a map and a street, right? Yeah. So in the classical text, there were no mobile phones. You, know, you go back like <laughs> a thousand or something years ago, there was no mobile phone. Right? But people, uh, it's like if you were with a friend and you in discussion with a friend, but also at the same time, you can see where you're walking, right? So same kind of thing. So that means that you look how the eye appears and then from the corner of the mind you start to analyze does it exist the way it appears and if so, will I be able to find it? So the way to do that is, is a very powerful technique is this one and different reasoning. Yeah. So that means if things exist they should be either one or different from body and mind, right? So that's the first kind of reason we have to agree upon. You know, so the stable is different from the statue, right? And the statue is different from the table. The statue itself is one with the statue, and the table itself is one with the table, right? You see that? But the table is different from the statue. You agree? So whatever exists is either one or different from the statue. You agree? Or not? Oh, easy. You're very easy going. <laughs> Sometimes people say, no, but, and they try to argue with all kinds of reasons, but, uh, yeah, it should be either one or different from the statue, right? Whatever exists, <coughs> right? So in the same way, whatever exists is either one or different, one with or different from body and mind, right? There's no other possibility. You agree? Yeah. So that means, this I that appears, very concrete. Ah, oh, you know, how dare this person say this to me? I am not like that. You know, that concrete I that appears, or I need this, I need that, you know. <clears throat> so, that I that appears, does that exist or not? That's the question. That I, that concrete I, causes these structural emotions to come up, right? So then the question is, does it exist the way it appears? That's the question. So then you check. If it exists, it should be one or different from body and mind, right? It's better to say, re ma re, means yes or no. You know? So it means, whatever exists, <laughs> is either one or different from body and mind, right? We agree upon. So that's the first, that's the first reason. Yeah? So whatever exists, if this self exists the way it appears, it should be one or different from body and mind, right? Yeah? That's the first reason. That's the first thing you have to agree upon. Yeah, so you all have this image of how, how the eye appears. And then you have this reasoning and say, okay, if it exists the way it appears, it should be one or different from body and mind. No other possibility. Right? So that's the first reason. Yeah, so there is one or different from body and mind. Yeah. Uh, the first reason, so to say. So this, if you agree upon that, then you start with the next reason. So first you get the object refutation clear, oh, that's how it appears. Then you check. If it exists, it's one or different from body and mind. No other possibility. Right? So then the next step is, okay, if it's one or different, then first check. If it's one with body and mind, next reason. Right? 
So if it's one with the body and mind. So you check and you see if it's one with the body, it should have similar aspects. It should have many aspects, so to say. Like the organs, the, the different limbs of the body, the chest, everything, the head. You know. So it should have many aspects, right? If it's one with the body, you see that? Because the body has many aspects, so it's one with the body, it should have many aspects. But it appears to be one only. The way how it appears is just all by itself. Like, you, you know, like kind of, you know, unitary, and all by itself. So it doesn't appear to have many aspects, right? So it's one with the body, it has to have many aspects. Which is not the case. You see that? So you reason, oh, it cannot be one with the body. You see that? That's kind of the reason you apply. That if it exists as one or different from the body and mind, then if it exists as one or different from the body, if it exists the way it appears, it's one or different from the mind, right? That's the reason we go into. And you check if it's one with the body, then it should be as many aspects, right? And it doesn't appear like that. It appears to be just uniform, it's all by itself. Right? So it cannot be one with the body. You see that? Yeah? Is it following still or not? I'm losing people. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sometimes people, if you sometimes they talk about emptiness, some people fall asleep or just walk away. <laughs> you need some kind of... Uh, to understand emptiness is not easy, right? And it takes time. But just a little bit of understanding will bring so much great benefit because then you see that nothing exists as concrete. Then destructive emotions will not have their roots to grow. So that's a very important issue. So, is one or different? That's the first reason. So, it's check. If it's one with the body, then it should have uh, many aspects, but that's not how it appears. Yeah, the thing we try to examine does it exist exactly as it appears? Because the way it appears causes a problem, right? So, because the way it appears causes a problem, we have to examine if it exists exactly the way it appears. That's the question. You know? So, it appears to be one. Right? And if it exists in that way, actually it cannot exist because if it's one with the body, the body has many parts, many aspects, right? So it cannot exist just unitary and also being one with the body. That's not possible. You see that? A little bit? So that's, then you say, oh, it's not one with the body, maybe it's different from the body. Right? So then you put your body aside and see how the eye still appears, but you say, my body my arm, my leg. So it's not inherently different. You see that? So, and also sometimes it seems to be mixed with the body. How it appears. So it's not one, and then you see it's not different. You see that? A little bit? <laughs> so, okay, so that's the body. And then, next question. So one with body and mind. So we did the body. It's not one. And it's not different. <laughs> oh, then we think, oh, it's the mind. Our continuity of consciousness. That's the self, right? But then you check your continuity of consciousness. And also there you can see in the different moments of consciousness, in the different aspects of more coarse, more subtle, the different perceptions of what we hear, what we see, what we smell, what we taste, what we feel, you know? In all of that process, it's many aspects, right? So if you say it's one with the mind, then also that doesn't apply because the mind has many aspects. So because of having many aspects, but the eye appears to be one, so it cannot exist that way. You see that? So it cannot exist one with the mind. Then you say, oh, maybe it's separate from the mind. Right? So then you see, but still you say, my mind, my thinking, my this, my that. So you cannot inherently have a separate I from consciousness, right? So you can see it's not one with consciousness and not different from consciousness. So based on the first reason, you say if it exists, it's one with body and mind. That was the first reason, right? Then you say, okay, if it exists, it's one or different from the body, right? Then you check, it's not one, it's not different from the body. It's not one or different from the mind. And then you see, oh! It doesn't exist the way it appears. So you come to that conclusion, right? So at that time, the person gets an insight into emptiness. Because emptiness meaning an absence 
of concrete inherent existence. How did I appear all by itself from its own side, right? Now you see it doesn't exist, and now you see it doesn't exist in the way it appears. So that means there's a kind of absence or lack of concrete existence, which we call emptiness. Yeah, emptiness meaning empty of something. So this room is empty of an elephant, right? There's no elephant in the room. You agree? Yeah, that's an easy one. <laughs> so that means that uh, the lack of the elephant exists at the moment, right? The moment you, you put the elephant in the room, then that lack of the elephant doesn't exist. You see that? Right. So, at the moment, there's an absence of an elephant. So there's emptiness of something, right? It's not the real emptiness, but a lack of something. So emptiness is the same thing. Emptiness meaning a lack or an absence of something. An absence of something or what? Of inherent existence or concrete existence. You see that? So that's a little bit proves that emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. It's a kind of absence of concrete existence. Yeah, so that's what we talk about. Then you know what emptiness is not just nothingness, it's empty of something. Empty of what? Empty of concrete existence. You know, empty of inherent existence, technically we classify it. Yeah. Because if you analyze with this one and different reason, you know, you say, okay, that's how the eye appears. Yeah. If it exists the way it appears, we should be able to find it somewhere, right? You're right? If things exist, then you have to be able to find it somewhere. So, then you check, how does it appear? Very concrete, kind of strong recognition is needed. Without this understanding of how does the eye appear, when somebody scolds you, very concrete eye, how dare this person say this to me? That kind of yeah, appearance is very important to, to recognize, otherwise the other reasons don't make sense. And sometimes when you manage on evidence, it looks like that the soon you start to analyze, how the IAP starts to fade away. So that's why you have to go back. How does it appear? And then analyze. So that's the one and the reasoning. So, if you understand that well, and you see that it doesn't exist the way it appears, you come to this insight that the world around us is not that concrete as it appears. Right? So we see buildings, we see cars system from their own side, out there. But there's a lot of dependence, right, to, to have, a, have a, you know, a house or something like that. It's like so many constant conditions are needed and even on a momentary level there's change. So now it's a nice bright kind of new painted you know, center, but the paint on the walls will disintegrate, right? It will not always remain the same. So that means one day you will see it paint start to fall off. And that doesn't happen overnight. So as soon as the wall, you know, put on the paint, as soon as you put on the paint, it starts disintegrating, right? Same for our body, you know. As soon as we, you know, read, uh, reach a certain age, then gray, gray hair is coming through, and then wrinkles coming, and you know, uh, the body is decaying. Yeah, so there's not a truth of reality many people don't like. Because they don't like to get more hassles with getting old. But to be honest, after you, you know, 40 something or 50, or it's not that it's going better and better and better after that. You know, it's going basically a little bit down the hill, right? So, the same with my eyes when I was 40 something, then I needed glasses. You know, so I went to Miser to check out. And this doctor was so kind. He didn't say, she didn't say, you know, you're getting old, they don't have to say that. You know. Maybe they're not even allowed to say that. And so he said, oh, after this and this age, your eyes have to be adjusted. <laughs> right? But actually the meaning of it is, you're getting old, right? So if you never like to know that aspect of reality, and you look in the mirror and you think, oh, same. But you're not the same. Right? So when, when gray, gray hair is coming through or wrinkles coming through, we can expect that from coming into being, right? That's a reality. So if you don't like to understand that reality, then when we meet that reality, it's a bit of an issue. So if you, for example, wake up 
<laughs> if you wake up and you're like 20 years older, all of a sudden, and you look in the mirror, there's kind of a shock to the system, probably. You know? So luckily it goes over time. But momentarily we change it. But when you look in the mirror, it looks like, ah, see? And the fairy from its own side existing face. Same as yesterday, same as tomorrow. We think like that, but actually it's not. So that's, that's an aspect of reality uh, to be known. So the momentary change. But it appears very concrete. So that's in relation with this first level of dependent origination, right? That things are in the nature of cause and conditions, right? Because of aging, right, we, we change. If you look at a picture when you were 16 and you look in the mirror, there's a difference, right? And that difference didn't come just over one night or two nights. That came from the moment you were 16 until the present. Every split second was a change, right? So, so yeah, in that way we can see how dependent origination helps us to not grasp at these kind of things concrete existing from their own side. Right. So that's a very helpful way to understand how destructive emotions come about and how uh, yeah, and how actually that causes suffering. As we talked about yesterday, how these destructive emotions actually cause suffering and how they're rooted, as we saw, in this kind of ignorance, a concrete concept of I am I. Yeah, so that's a bit, bit. So then maybe we have a, some chai. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And after the chai, we're going to talk about compassion. Yeah, so, because if you understand ignorance and you understand it's possible to get rid of this ignorance, you understand it's possible to achieve liberation. Right? Because you understand it's possible to eliminate all these afflictions because they're rooted in ignorance. If you take away ignorance, there's no concrete aspect of reality, so that means. There's no possibility for the afflictions to grow. Right? So you take away afflictions, that means more happiness. And on the ultimate level, nirvana, the ultimate peace of nirvana. Right? Yeah. So uh, that's the bit. And if you understand that aspect, then it's easier to generate compassion for others because you understand the suffering, you understand the cause of suffering, and you understand the possibility to free others from suffering as well. So that's uh, we discuss after the break. Not to hear any questions? Yeah, I have. Oh, a, yes. But I yeah, understood, I mean, sort of understood when you said uh, one and different. Yeah. One, because it can't be one with that because there's there so many aspects. Yeah. But what is the different? I didn't get that. Mm. How is it different? Not so different? if you see how it appears, right? And then you think it's completely different from the body. Sometimes it appears to be in control. Right, controller, but it seems to be mixed with the body, you know, because we say my body, my this, my that. You know? So if you isolate it separate from the body, you know, then it cannot exist that way because we say my body, my this, my that. So it's also another <laughs> another technique here you can do. It's just to visualize, right? If you cut parts of your body, you know, then see how that influences this apprehension of the eye, because. Then you see there's a relationship between the two. So that means it, it cannot inherently exist separate from the body, right? You see that? Yeah, so because it appears to be one, it appears to be in control, but if you analyze it's not one with the body, neither is it inherently separate, you see? So if it's not one with the body and not separate from the body, then from the point of view, a relation with the body, it cannot exist. So in a similar reason, you apply with the mind. Because we have body and mind, right? So then you see if it's one with the mind or different from the mind. So you can analyze it's not one because there's many aspects of the mind and it appears to be one. So it cannot exist in that particular way, one with the mind, right? So then you take it inherently separate from the mind, and the same thing applies that we say my mind, my thinking, my this. It seems to be related. So it cannot be inherently separate, you see that? And then you come to the conclusion that doesn't exist the way it appears. Because of the first reasoning, if it exists the way it appears, it should be one or different from body and mind. You see that? Yeah? Yeah? Is it a bit more clear or not? Yeah. Meditate on it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you. So, this is a question. Yeah. Yeah. So, maybe you should be like, keep on emptiness. Yeah. So, we understand that I, 
is, does not exist with the body nor the mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can generate happiness by uh, choosing the particular cause. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, we can generate happiness. Happiness means kind of an absence of suffering, right? Yes, it's a cause and effect. Yeah, so an absence of suffering meaning an absence, if you have an absence of destructive emotions, does that produce happiness? Right there? Yes. Exactly. So, yeah. Not only. Yeah. 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 So that means that if there's no afflictions, there's no suffering, right? So what is the root cause for the afflictions to arise is this ignorance. So if this ignorance is not present, then there's no afflictions. If there's no afflictions, there's no suffering. You see that? And it refers to I and O, right? Emptiness and you're talking about. So I have just this query of this non-duality. Yeah. Can just add like that? Non-dual, yeah. Is it dual or non-dual? Yes. Emptiness by itself. It's not dual in that aspect because all everything we can think of is empty of inherent existence, right? This table empty of inherent existence, the statue is empty of inherent existence, our body and mind is empty of inherent existence. So this is kind of universal truth for ultimate reality. Everything is empty of inherent existence. You see that? Yeah. And even later on. We recited the Art Sutra, Atayata, Gata, Gata, Bara, Gata, Bara, Samgata, Bodhi, Soha, right? So there's different levels of mental development. Gata, Gata, then Bara, Gata, Bara, Samgata, you know? So on the Gata, Gata, so on the first, on the Bara, Gata, the emptiness, the realization of emptiness is what we call the direct perception. At that time, the mind realizing emptiness and emptiness itself are in one text, they are non-dual. So normally when we see things, there's a mind and an object, two separate things. Right? So when there's a direct perception, the mind realizing emptiness and emptiness itself, there's no duality anymore. You see that? So at that time there's a kind of direct perception without duality of observer and object. So it becomes a very profound aspect of realization. Yeah, at that time it's not duality. One. Yeah, I, yeah one in the sense of course, there is an object emptiness and there's a mind realizing it, but how it appears, there's no duality anymore at that time. But that's, uh, you know, but uh, in the future, yeah. it doesn't come, it doesn't come tomorrow or something. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Now, actually practicing this in real life is, is very, very difficult. Yeah. Especially at the workplace, yeah. because how it works is your performance, yeah. your your appraisals, yeah. and your, your appreciation. Yeah. So it's all about yeah. I in the workplace. Uh, depends. Uh, yes, you were yesterday evening or not? Yes. Uh, yesterday evening I talked about this uh, potential project and the, mm -hmm. the research they did, and then with world leading kind of organizations and CEOs and 25,000 leaders of the world, right? So it's not just kind of short, it's a small kind of research, it's kind of mainstream. Right. And it's been published by Harvard uh, Business Review, Reviews Publication. So it's kind of not just something from the corner of the street, just put together, right? So that's where they come to the conclusion for a successful leader, CEOs of big companies like Google and many, many big companies, Microsoft, who, who, who are in big question. You know? So when they come to a good leader, has to has these three kind of aspects. Of, of, of how to behave. One is mindfulness, right? to be aware and be focused, so to say. The other one is compassionate, and the third one is selflessness. So, if you, if a leader only thinks about him or herself and doesn't think about a team, you know, then, then <laughs> doesn't think about the team, then at that time. So then, because it is only self-centered concern. I just one thing. Subhashini, that's too much. Subhashini. Subhashini. Maybe just. So that means that uh, the funny point of view of, of kind of world leaders or leaders in big companies. 
it's been proven if there's only self-centered concern, they're not very successful. It's only temporarily there might be some benefit for them, but on the long term there's no really constructive benefit. You see? So that's some people think uh, you have to, you know, uh, well, yourself, this, this, of, but actually on the long term it's not really very constructive. And there's many of these types of research, and this organization they train for on a different time, mainly all leading companies. So it seems to be proven in this research that if, if a CRO or, or a top manager is capable of not being too selfish, you know, to think about the team and the company and different things, then there's more actually progress and more success. So if you're interested, you should read that book, very interesting book, yeah, The World of a Leader. Or the mind of a leader. Yeah. 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 You, uh, I, I absolutely agree that the I uh, feels very strong and very real, but mm. I'm not so sure that it doesn't have many aspects. I know. Then you have to check a bit more how it appears. It doesn't have any aspects. It's, it, it appears to be unitary, one all by itself, right? No, it doesn't. That it has, it has a, a lot of aspects. Yeah. Then so, you have to check a bit more, maybe. How, how should one, how should one get there? So, for example, when somebody criticizes you, and that's a very con strong concept of I am I that comes up, right? see how it appears, and then try to isolate it, recognize it. That's the first step, to see how it appears. Yeah. No, it appears very real. Yeah. It has, it doesn't appear like it has a unitary aspect. Either. And then, then you should check a bit more, because that's mostly how it appears, you know, the self existing all by itself without dependence as one, one kind of, you know, unitary kind of identity or something like that. That's how it appears, right? But anyway, you, you have to check maybe a bit more. It depends, because, yeah. It depends, uh, on because the conventional, the conventional self, right, which is not a problem, has of course many aspects because it's a conventional self imputed upon the body and mind, right? You know, so that has many aspects. Yeah, so you have to make a clear distinction between how this inner and self appears and our conventional self. It's two different things, right? Because conventionally we have a body, conventionally we're thinking, conventionally we're talking about things, conventionally we're experiencing things, right? So maybe you should check a little bit more how does it appear when affliction, anger, attachment, jealousy, pride arises, or or uh, when you get uh, kind of, uh, you know, people irritate you and the eye comes up, you know, then you can check how does the people. So that's what I mean. It depends on it depends on who has uh, who has uh, you know which mm. person at that point of time yeah. has raised that eye. Yeah. Like if it's my daughter, then I feel how dare she say this to me? I'm her mother. Yeah. And if it's uh, I'm junior, know. then I feel how dare he say this to me? I'm the teacher. Yeah. You know? So, but so it how? Has many yeah. Aspects. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, so, so. Smarter, yeah. I'm how, is, yeah. There's know? two things there. How dare this person say this to me? That's one. I am this. Yes. There's two. Right? That's an aspect. Yeah. But the thing what we're talking about is this aspect, not this one. So, how dare this person say this to me? Right. I am this. I am that. I am this. I am that. I am this. And that. Right? That's right. So it's all coming from this one. You know. It's a very concrete concept of I, kind of universal kind of concept of concrete I, mine. And because of that we say, oh, I'm not like this, I'm like that, or I'm this position, or I'm that position, I'm this, you see? So the, the conception of I'm the teacher, or I'm the mother, or I'm the father, or I'm this, I'm that, that's related with this center, right? But it's based on this concrete I, mine, that appears as one, we say, oh, I'm this. Or I guess first say this to me. I'm not like this. You see? So that, that aspect has to be recognized. Because based on that concrete concept of I am mine, we just start to say different things. But isn't that then the same as the body? You say my body. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I got I got a body ache. Yeah. But then you isolate it already, the body ache is actually in my knee or it's on my yeah. hip or something. Yeah. So that also has aspects. I mean yeah. if the argument True. is that if the argument is that the I doesn't exist because it doesn't have aspects and yeah. the body, uh, like the body has aspects, yeah. then that doesn't quite, I, I can't quite understand that. Because there's a concrete I, right, that appears, and based on this I we say, 
my body, my this, my that, my this, my that, right? So that means it's all rooted in this, um, this aspect of I am I. You see? So based on that we say my body, my this, my that. You see? But it's all rooted in this kind of concrete concept I am I. And this appears unitary all by itself. And because of this we say my body, my this, I'm the teacher, I'm this, I'm that. Yeah? How dare this person say this to me? Right? But this me, I, is actually this concrete concept. What are we talking about here? Yeah, a bit more clear or not? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm Contemplate it. Yes, sir. Yeah, check it out. Yeah. You would have to respond to certain situations. Yeah. It is by following uh, meditation and everything. Now we do not react. So we need to respond. Yeah. So, like, you know, as the norm, yeah. How would you advise us, you know, mm. like, you need to analyze to all these things, how quick you need to be in responding to that particular situation? I do. So... <laughs> you do it very fast, or it should be step back, you know, just take one or three minutes. Yeah. But the situation might be not... If you take two or three minutes. Two or three, three minutes. You can't wait, some situations yeah. require us to respond yeah. immediately. Yeah, true. Yeah. So by the power of habituation, if you habituate yourself to this pattern, you can act much quicker, right? So if this habituation is lacking, you need time to adjust. So if you're an Olympic meditator, you know what to respond. Yeah, in yeah. but if you're not an Olympic <laughs> meditator, then you have to take time, right? But that's also training, right? It's possible. Okay. So maybe initially you have to take some time, but you may still make mistakes, right? We're not perfect straight after the first kind of training. You know? So it's a, a slow process. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to recognize a particular affliction, right? That's the first. You have to deal with it in two ways. Right? So we have a destructive emotion and a cause of destructive emotion. Right? So destructive emotion like anger has faults. Right? So that we have to analyze in you know, what we call analytical meditation. You know? So and practicing patience has many qualities. Right? So you focus, analyze the faults of anger in meditation. You come to a conclusion, you focus on that conclusion. Right? That gives you an insight. Same thing with practicing patience, you think about the benefits and the qualities, you come to a conclusion, focus on this conclusion. There's two insights there, you see? The fault of the destructive emotion and the benefits of its antidote. You see that? So the stronger your insights are in those two aspects, it generates a very strong form of mindfulness. Right? Mindfulness is, is a translation of remembrance. So next time you come into a situation that can cause you to get irritated, yeah, with alertness, with one mental factor we train to be more aware, you see, if you do, for example, the counting of the breath meditation, right? You do here, or you do, right? So then you learn how to become more aware of how things appear, right? So the more you do this kind of concentration meditation, you use this mental factor, right? to check if the mind is either getting distracted or not, right? This kind of from the corner of the mind, which we call alertness, some people translate it as introspection, some translate it as uh, meta-awareness, depends how we translate, but this kind of awareness is being capable of checking what's going on. So the moment the first second of irritation comes, you be aware of it. It's awareness is very important. I said yesterday, self-awareness, self-discipline, right? Those steps are very important. So, initially, before we engage in this kind of trainings, when we get angry, it just happens to us, right? Before we know it, we're in the middle of it, <laughs> and then we cannot do anything anymore, right? It's too late. We better go for a walk and try to relax and, you know. But if, on a constructive way, if you think about it on a daily basis, the faults of anger and the benefits of patient's antidote, yeah, that generates insights. So next time, together with this counting of the breath meditation, it builds awareness, right? So instead of just being overpowered like an emotional hijack, if you be more aware, you can see irritation coming up. In, in early days or in the past, maybe you saw it like in one kind of solid kind of thing of a few minutes and you cannot see the differences. But the more awareness you build up, you will see the first split second, then the next split second. You will see the individual seconds of how this irritation 
is building up. Yeah? So that's kind of awareness we have to try to generate. You see that? That's first step. Then as soon as you see that there's irritation, then with the mindfulness, which is motivated and you know by this kind of reasoning of the analytical meditation of the benefits of practicing patience and the faults of anger, you remember. So you be aware, oh, there's a little bit of irritation coming there. Then you remember the, the meditation, and you give, that gives you the power and mindfulness to see, oh, it's not very constructive if I follow this negative thought of anger, right? And you be convinced of that because of the analytical meditation before. So that fuels this mindfulness, and it gives you the power and the strength not to follow this destructive emotion. You see that? So that's one level of how to deal with afflictions in day-to-day -day life. So then when I talk about today, is we do that, first of all, these meditations as, with analytical aspects of the faults of anger and the, the benefits of practicing patience, right? So that helps us to come to a kind of understanding and build this mindfulness. On top of that, if you also contemplate this ultimate aspect of reality, it able to cut the root later on. Yeah? So we have to work on two levels, right? Because emptiness is not that easy and it will not have the power to give the antidote at its initial stage. Right. So on its initial stage, what we do is contemplate the faults of anger and the benefits of its antidote, practical patience. If you are convinced of that, then when it comes up, the irritation, you be aware of that irritation, and you think, oh, if I follow anger again, I will make the same mistake. And I'm not going to do that, because now I'm convinced. Right? Same yesterday, I said, if you're a smoker and you look at the package with a photograph of cancer in the lungs, if you just take it and just say, okay, yeah, it's not good for you, then it doesn't affect, right? But if you really look and then contemplate and analyze, and then it starts, the image starts to make sense, right? You see that? So that means uh, the, the, the image on the package will only be of benefit if, if the smoker starts to think about, with reasoning, to prove that it's not good for him. Right? And then it has the power to look for means to stop. Right? This reasoning is very important. You see that? So then we do that on a daily basis, contemplating the faults of anger and the benefits of practicing patience. Right? So then when situations come into being, then you try to see the danger of, you know, that you go to make the same mistake and be aware of that. And if it's in the initial stage, when anger the little bit of irritation is there, you can still move the mind in another direction. But when it's too strong, it's very difficult to move it anymore. When you really start to get irritated and, you know, it's too late, right? So then it's better just to relax and try again next time. You see? Yeah? That makes sense? Like, so example, not this woman is not going to repeat that. Yeah. The media person was asking about the Chinese, did they kill him? Yeah. So his answer was something very positive. Yeah, yeah. Can you repeat that too? Ali, when they kill me, I, I continue next time. Uh -huh. So yeah. it's not easy for a normal people to answer like that. No, it's that's true. That's, that's, that's definitely true. true. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, it's not possible for an ordinary person to answer in that way. But at least we can see the possibility of moving in that direction in the future, right? So that it's inspiring to see the potential of the mind in that way we're talking about it. Because if you only think, yeah, it's difficult, it's difficult, yeah, it's difficult, yeah, it's difficult, it is difficult, but move on, come on, we have to do something, right? Same as my mother, I said yesterday, when my father passed away, there was sadness, but there was no depression, because she understood that impermanence, because she was thinking about it, right? And then she would say, okay, it's sad, but life has to go on, because if I start thinking about it, and the, uh, it doesn't make life better, and it doesn't bring back the, 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 the relative, because in, in her case, her husband, right? So it didn't bring back the husband, if you think about it too much. That's how we deal with a situation mentally. It makes such incredible difference in experiencing more or less suffering, right? Because there is an issue, yeah? But on top of that, oh, mentally, when we create even more problems, then it's more suffering which is not needed, right? You see that? So that's why mentally, how we think about things, it's so essential. That's why I said yesterday also, among most of the Tibetans, it looks like there's no post-traumatic stress disorder if you, of those who have been tortured for decades sometimes. Yeah. Well, physically, with electric shocks, it's kind of, they have to be treated. 
but mentally it's so strong. You see? So there's physically some suffering, but no mentally suffering on top of that. Because mental suffering you can prevent by thinking in a very constructive way. You see that? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Makes sense. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you had a very good Yeah. Right? It doesn't mean that in ordinary life you cannot think about these things. Right? Say in the morning, if you just take a few minutes, right, in the morning to see that things don't exist the way they appear. And then every hour during the day you try to reflect upon that insight. Then you can learn a lot because you see oh, everything appears so concrete. Or the eye gets very concrete. But actually, if you analyze, it doesn't exist the way it appears. So that insight, that insight will help a lot, also in daily life. And the more you think about it, the more it breaks down this concrete appearance. And if that concrete appearance is broken down, then also the afflictions will not really find roots to grow. You see that? So that this can be great benefit. Of course, we have to, what I just discussed, have to apply direct antidotes, you know, like patience towards anger, contentment towards attachment, right? And, and because I'm uh, rejoicing towards jealousy yeah. and like to see the faults of yourself and the qualities of others regarding with uh, getting pride or not, right? So every affliction or every destructive emotion has its own antidote, right? So that's one aspect in the uh, example I just explained with the meditation on, on anger and, and, the, and the antidote patients, right? So that's one technique we, we do on a daily basis. And then to get to the roots, Eventually, if we slowly try to understand our understanding of emptiness, then that starts to make sense in the long term. So there's two ways when we can transform the mind. You know? And that you can do in daily life, to see how things appear and how things actually exist. Yeah. Try, homework. Yeah. yeah. Homework for next yeah. time. Yeah. One more and then we have the tea because right. way over time. You mentioned something new which I have not heard for so many years now. Ale. <laughs> the direct perception of emptiness involves... Ale. Uh, <laughs> you know, You're very alert, yeah. You said it involves uh, the non-duality or the emptiness of the phenomena. Yeah. And the observer of the non-duality being non-dual. Yeah. No, does this mean that the person who is observing the non-duality of the phenomena, mm. at the same time, also knows or expounds that this particular phenomena is made up of parts. Mm. This particular phenomena arises out of causes and conditions. Mm. This particular phenomena is naturelessness. Mm. Do these thoughts appear to the person mm -hmm. who is observing emptiness directly? Emptiness directly. Yeah. This is my question. Yeah. Does he evaluate or is there something mystical? Very easy answer. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no means when when the person realizes emptiness directly. Uh -huh which is direct perception, there's no thought consciousness present at that time. So when he gets out of the meditation, right, he gets out of the meditation, then things appear very concrete, but the person sees it's just an illusion. Because it's made out of parts, collection of parts, cause and effect relationships. That's the post-meditation session, right, what you're referring to. That post meditation yeah. session, I and mean, if you during meditation, does it uh, during the diet perception? Mm -hmm. So the question that arises then is this diet perception a mental phenomena, mm -hmm. or is it a, uh, uh, is it something to do with uh, mm -hmm. not exactly physical, yeah. not exactly physical, but something intermediate between the physical and mental? No, because uh, uh, the mind that directly perceives emptiness only emptiness appears, nothing else. Emptiness, but that's emptiness of the phenomena, right? Yeah. Or if it's emptiness phenomenal or emptiness of a self of a person, at that time only emptiness appears, nothing else. So it's not like, oh, conventional things exist like that way. That doesn't appear, right? Except in the mind of a Buddha, right? Yeah, yeah. Only when you have a mind of a fully enlightened being, then you have direct perception of emptiness together with conventional reality can be realized at the same time with direct perception. But for an ascension being, that's not possible. So that means when Arya being on the part of seeing, yeah, 
has the direct perception of emptiness, only emptiness appears. When the person gets out of the meditation and looks around and walks around for a cup of tea, then the cup of tea appears out there from its own side, but the person realizes, oh, it appears in that way, but actually doesn't exist in that way. Is that what about the other being on the path of meditation? Same thing. No. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 no, 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 no. What I mean is that even for him, whether he's within the state of meditation or yeah. so is, when there, when is there a state of is there a state of mind that is out of the state of meditation for him? Uh, yeah, when when a person gets out of the meditation, right? At that time, then things appear, con conventional things appear as true as they exist from their own side, but the person sees it as an illusion. It sees it as it's not reality, like a dream. <coughs> so same, same thing, if you were you dream, you're dreaming a dream, right? Then what appears to you in the dream, knowing you're dreaming, is kind of an illusion, right? You know, it's not reality. So for, for a person in post-meditative uh, states, in, after direct perception, things appear like that. Things appear like real, but actually you see, it's like same as a person in a dream, being aware you're dreaming. It appears, but you know it's not reality. So, the person who uh, sees this as that this is a dream, this is not reality, yes. it appears as a reality, yeah. to such a person, yeah. is he not now then at the point of seeing a phenomena as appearing as reality, is he not imputing at that stage? And it doesn't have to, I mean, he knows it's in the nature of mere imputation, right? But how things merely appear. He straightway sees it's like an illusion. But like at, at, that instant, at that instant, the moment he sees that it's a uh, mere reputation, it should translate into emptiness, right? No, no, it's, it appears existing from its own side, but he knows it's like an illusion. Why? Because it's merely imputed. Right? Yes. Sir. So at that time, it's kind of conventional reality how it appears, but he realizes it doesn't exist the way it appears. So it sees it as an illusion or like a dream. If you're aware of the dream, you know that what you're dreaming is not reality, right? So in a similar way, things appear, but actually the person sees it's not reality. But we don't know it then, we don't really know it. Yeah, so <laughs> that's what our ordinary mean is like that. But there are people who know the dream is a dream, right? Or there's even people who know they, they're dreaming in a dream, that they, they know they're dreaming in a dream. You know, some people, they dream, they're sleeping, and they're dreaming. So there's an awareness of the dream, dreaming something else. So some people have the capacity, right? So for us ordinary beings, we're not aware. So that's the same thing. Direct perception of emptiness is something for the future. You have to do some homework to get there, right? So that means that to know the capacity of developing, sometimes it's very inspiring to know what are the possibilities of the mind, right? There's many stories. So a person who understands whether he's in the meditative yeah. phase, Direct perception of emptiness, yeah. and once he comes out of the meditation, mm -hmm. also uh, if he's aware that it is a, he's aware of the direct perception of emptiness, mm -hmm. that person will be always very calm and very cool. I like yeah. that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Yeah. 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 Because there's no concrete aspect of reality, there's no, no reason to, to argue, there's no reason to get upset. Because they know everything is native cause and effect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. So we, that's good to know, because that potential we have, right? So if you know that potential, then it's inspiring to think about these things. And emptiness by itself is not easy. But just to think about emptiness is so incredible. Because Arya Deva in the 400 verses, he says, just thinking about emptiness we do now, all the foundations of samsara is like they, they start to break and disintegrate, right? Meaning the suffering starts to end. Not like like that, but you know, a slow process. And that's how we come on the cycle of birth and death. Yeah, later on. Yeah, because if you understand emptiness, right, or a little bit, it will shake this ignorance. And ignorance is the cause for karma and affliction to arise. Karma and affliction is the direct cause for suffering. So if no ignorance, there's no karma and affliction. There's no common reflection, there's no suffering, you see? Yeah. So that's why it's, yeah, it's important to know. But don't worry, because emptiness is, is very complicated. When, <laughs> when I received the first teachings of emptiness from His Holiness Dalai Lama in France, 1993, it was 
the Jimba was translating in English, and then uh, I was new to Buddhism, right? So I was just listening to this excellent translation, but it didn't make sense to me because I didn't understand. Him, so I just took out my earplugs and just listened to some in Tibetan because of that time also I didn't know Tibetan. So it was the same, same kind of reason, you know, but uh, after time, even as Holy Dalai Lama says, you know, after a few decades of studying emptiness and reflecting upon it, now slowly start to understand it. So that's a, if a mind of His Holiness says something like that, then we know we have to put some effort to get to that kind of level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just think about it again and again and again, and then one day you get a realization. When I had my doubts and asked Gan Tirimche, the head of the Kaluku tradition, about these things, he said, yeah. you study it for a few decades, you try to put it into practice, you do it for a few lifetimes, and realization is <laughs> fine. It's, it's, uh, it's very easy. It's a very good mindset not to expect too much within a few years. Because if you know our consciousness is there since the beginning of lifetime, Right? And we have all these habituation patterns built up to break them down in a perfect time. So then a, a few lifetimes is, is not a big deal. You know? But the imprints are planted, so the more you plant the seeds, right, the one day done, it will bring a harvest, right, when the right conditions are met. You know? So when you, when you hear about the story about Buddha when he was teaching in Rajkir, for example, then so many people realize emptiness, just like that. By just hearing one or two or three verses. But that doesn't mean that's random. That means those people who were present, they put a lot of effort in previous lifetimes to understand them, right? like we do now. There's some difficulty involved. Oh, it's so difficult. And I don't understand. And, you know, then don't give up. But keep going because that's the only way forward. And though it's difficult, but the more you try to develop, understanding will come someday, right? Because the seeds are planted. You see? So that's kind of, uh, yeah, I'm a kind of an optimistic person in life in general, but, <laughs> but <laughs> to, to think in that way, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's more constructive than thinking, oh, it's too difficult, it's too difficult, maybe we have to put it aside again, you know? Because if you think like that, then you never improve, right? Things are difficult in life, but if you put some effort, then you will gain, you know, get some achievements. But don't expect it in a few years, but, you know, long term planning. And for the long-term planning, we have to relax, and that's why we have tea. Yes, you come and share to the audience. Yeah, or just a cup of tea is fine. No, no, please come and have some. So to go back to the title of today, yeah, courageous compassion, courageous compassion, and ultimate reality. So we talked about a uh, little bit about compassion. We talked a little bit about uh, ultimate reality. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about courageous compassion to, to make it a bit stronger. Yeah. So compassion, as we saw, is kind of a mind that wishes others to be free of suffering. Right. So there's different levels, as we saw. So one level is how wonderful it will be if all sentient beings be free of suffering. Right. Second one is may they be free of suffering. Right. And the third one is, I will cause them to be free of suffering. Yeah, so this third one is kind of very courageous aspect. Yeah, so to take the responsibility of freeing uh, migrating beings, freeing essential beings. So how do we generate the types of compassion? Uh, so we have to get close to sentient beings. It's very important to get close. Because if you're not close to beings, it's very difficult. To generate compassion for them. Right. So there's different techniques to, to get close to sentient beings in order to generate this compassion. Um, yeah. So we, this close feeling only happens when we go through a process of seeing one aspect that we do the same. You know, we talked about it already yesterday. We all want happiness, don't want suffering, and that innate wish is in all of us. There's no exception. Right? So, as soon as you have a little headache, you want to get rid of it. Or a sickness, you want to get rid of it. If you a little bit happiness, you want to keep it. You know? So that's a wish we all share. Exactly the same intention. Exactly the same kind of uh, yeah, attitude.
So, uh, from that point of view, um, we, we should see oneself and others as equal in that regard, right? That we're all the same, really wanting happiness and wanting suffering. So, to enhance this a little bit more, we first have to prepare the fields of seeing everybody in the same nature. You know, we just talked about that person we dislike can be the best friend of somebody else, right? Person A, yeah, we dislike person A, somebody else likes person A, somebody else sees A as a stranger. Yeah. So person A is just a human being wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. That's also true for a person we like can be disliked by somebody else. And somebody else sees this person as a stranger, right? So that means that it's just a temporary perception of individuals that makes a differentiation between friend, enemy and stranger. Yeah, so also a stranger we saw on the street and we never met before, we have kind of indifferent feeling towards them. We can be the best friend of somebody else or the worst enemy of another person, right? So those three individuals, or we can classify all the people we know in our daily life into three individuals, right? Into those three groups, people we like, we dislike, and people we don't know. And according to our perception, we act in a particular way. Those we like, yes, kind of act in a particular way, those we dislike react in a particular way, and those we uh, see as a stranger react in a particular way. But it's only not from the point of view of the object, that's from the point of view of our perception, right, how we see. So that's, uh, we have to equalize those three, by seeing that it's just our temporary perception that makes a differentiation. Even over time, a yeah. person you dislike now, if you solve the problem, if there's an issue, mainly based on ignorance, not knowing what really is going on, right? To solve the problem and <coughs> then the person can be the best friend. And sometimes it happens that, oh, this person doesn't like me, I don't like the person because of this, because of this, because of this. But some, sometimes that's not true. Sometimes it's just our own mental fabrication, right? So by solving the problem, then the person we dislike initially can become the best friend, right? That happens. And the other way around. So over time it changes and different people have different kind of views. So that meaning it's preparing the field, or you know, like you prepare the field, make it all equal, right? Get rid of the stones and make sure when the seeds are planted, they will grow correctly. So the same thing, we have to prepare the fields of generating equanimity, first step. So the first step is this equanimity, right? So otherwise you will see, say, oh, may all sentient beings uh, always abide in them. Oh, how wonderful it will be if all sentient beings be free of suffering. May they be free of suffering. I will cause them to be free of suffering, except this one. Right? So if you say, if you start to say, except this one or except that one, then it's not really kind of real compassion, right? So that means this equanimity is lacking. So that's why equanimity is the first step to see all the people as equal, right? That's the first step. Yeah. And next step is we have to bring them close. The only way to bring them close is thinking how kind they are. Yeah, so that's a kind of very traditional Buddhist explanation uh, of all sentient beings. Uh, yeah, then you have to go, uh, who does not believe in reincarnation? Or you like it? Yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. okay. Check. Yeah, this, yeah. So reincarnation exists or doesn't exist, right? So that's, you have to check. Yeah, from Buddhist point of view, it makes sense to, you know, and there's also a lot of scientific evidence of children remembering pure lifetimes. There's things which we talk about non-local consciousness, which means there is perception without brain activity in a need that experience, for example. Yeah, so then even you know, the cardiologists who did research or medical doctors who did this research, they call it, they even call the term non-local consciousness, meaning there's perception at a time of a near-death experience, right? Uh, which doesn't, which hasn't every, which doesn't have any brain activity as such. So there's a consciousness without uh, having brain activity. And that perception, what's been perceived, can be validated <laughs> if the person comes back to life, right? So that the person is revived, comes back to life, and then we can validate the information being correct or incorrect. If the person doesn't come back to life, we cannot validate, right? So, but there are cases of people come back to life, and then we can validate what they have seen. And so that's from research. 
And then this, the, but the most uh, convincing one is Stevenson, Professor Stevenson from the University of Virginia in the US. He did research regarding children remembering previous lifetimes. Yeah, so uh, if you're interested, uh, it's very, uh, I studied hydrology, which is kind of mathematics and statistics, so I know a little bit about uh, how to check if, if you have the data, how to analyze the data, right? So if you put uh, these kind of case studies of Stevenson, it's like 40 years of study, 2,000 cases, you know, it's quite an intensive kind of you know, evidence what they came up with. And he himself, he says, I'm not proving reincarnation, but there is something that carries information from the previous personality to the present, right? So that's what we in Buddhism call the continuity of consciousness. Yeah? So then what people remember from the previous personality or from the previous birth, right, that uh, aspect can be validated. Yeah. And there's ma many cases where there's a birthmark of the cause of death of the previous personality showing on the, on the present personality. Right? So if you put those two things together, statistically, right, then they can talk about different places they came from from previous lifetime, as well as birthmarks of the cause of death of the previous personality and showing in the present. So if you take those two together, it's, it's quite solid. You know, it's not just cannot be kind of one in a billion kind of possibilities, not random, you know. So that means, from that point of view, you can see those case studies, uh, and you can even see that certain case studies, the habituation patterns of a previous personality already carry on in the present. So it's very interesting. If you're interested in that, you should read the book, uh, books, there's two, a few books actually, by one of the students of uh, Stevenson called Jim Tucker. Jim Tucker? And so Jim Tucker wrote a few books, and one of the most popular one is Life Beyond Life. It's a very, you know, kind of, not a thick kind of small paperback that summarizes Stevenson's research. Very interesting. And there's also one by a New York based journalist who was very skeptical about this kind of research. And then he asked Stevenson, Can I travel with you? I want to see. So they traveled together and then he wrote this book called old souls, you know, and then the author is called uh, Schroeder, it's kind of the German S-C-H-R-O-Umlaut, right, D-E-R, old souls, by Schroeder. So he's a New York based journalist who wrote about these events, initially very skeptical, later on he saw the research and was quite impressed, in the sense of, oh, Maybe it's possible, and it's for you <laughs> to think about. There's many other reasons that, yeah, <coughs> to think about as consciousness that does not depend on activity. Also, in Buddhist practice, in advanced levels of practice, there's possibility of using the clear light mind of that when the physical body is being considered as there's no, you know, the person died because no lung function, no heart. Activity, so the doctor comes and says this person is dead, right? But then, if the body doesn't decay in you know this kind of climate, and especially in summer, it gets a bit warmer here in the settlements, the settlements, and the doctor comes and says, hmm, we cannot explain this, you know, because if your body doesn't decay within a few days or a week or two weeks or sometimes three weeks, there's something going on, right? So we say the subtle mind is still in the body. The subtle mind doesn't need a physical brain as such. So anyway, and that subtle mind goes from this line to the next line. Right? So that's yeah, a few things to think about. Uh, and you have to know, yeah. So because if you discuss how to get the real, genuine form of compassion, you try to see if all sentient beings, at least once, have been your father or mother, or people will be kind to you in, in raising you, right? Because when you just come out of the womb, without other others, we don't survive. So we remember the kindness of others. That's the, that's the second step. So first is equanimity, right? Then based on equanimity, based on equanimity, uh, we generate kind of seeing that all beings, at least once, have been your father or mother, right? That's the second one. So first we have equanimity, 
then seeing all sentient beings of these ones have been your parents or friends or people who helped you, right? Yeah. So then the next step is to remember how kind they were. Right? So why do we do that? Because if you want to generate compassion and love and kindness, you have to get a very close feeling to sentient beings, right? So that's why if, if in that regard we remember them, how kind they were. You know, and you can look in the animal realm or other human beings, how much effort they put into taking care of, of, of the newborn babies and then in the grown-up process. You know? So sometimes you don't realize how kind our own mothers were. You know, I was a very naughty kind of uh, difficult child when I was young, I think. <laughs> so, but then uh, later on, when you have to take care of other children yourself, then actually you see how much uh, harm you give your mother. Because you do all this aspect, you, you know, you cook so much and then they don't like the food. Or you take them to uh, the water park in Mysore or something. You go to all the efforts <laughs> going there and then uh, in the end there's certain things they don't like. Right? So then you put so much effort but then it's not accomplished. You know? So then you actually see how kind, uh, how much hardship we gave to our own mothers. Because we were like that. No, I don't like this food. My mother was so clever too. We had Brussels sprouts, you know, it's very bitter, it's not very tasty. So my mother was so clever to, because she knew it's good for us, but we didn't like it. So she, she pressed them down and, and mixed it up with, with potatoes and butter and, you know, juice it up a bit. So then, then we had to finish eating. And then she said, ah, oh, I put Brussels sprouts in there. Oh, what? <laughs> so we got so angry, you know. But at the time of eating, we didn't know this, right? So we gave so much hardship to her. Kind of mother. Yeah. So actually, if you see how kind they are, for our purpose, they do so many things, right? So we try to remember how many people, if you find that difficult with parents or with this aspect, it's in daily life, even people. Thanks to them, we can function. Thanks to them, we can use public transport, we can order a taxi, or of course we have to pay for it, but people have to do these jobs, otherwise we were not able to have this possibility of having a quite you know, comfortable life compared to other places on the planet, right? And so that means by depending on the kindness of others, you know, we try to remember the kindness, right? That's the second step. So first is equanimity, then seeing them as your parents or people who do care, right? Since beginning's lifetime. So that means that there's no reason why not all sentient beings at least once have been so kind, right? So then we don't exclude any beings anymore, you see that? So we have equanimity and then we say all sentient beings have been so kind to us. And then we remember the kindness you know, by uh, mothers taking care or, you know, you see even cats taking care of the kittens. It's like, they put so much effort in raising them, you know, giving milk and then the mother gets really skinny and, and you know, they put so much effort and licking them clean and all the dirty parts as well, you know, it's like so amazing what they do for the baby borns and the new borns, right? So, so then you remember the kindness, yeah? And then, uh, then you generate a wish to repay the kindness, you see? So if you remember the kindness and then want to repay the kindness, it becomes a very close feeling to all such beings. So, based on this concept of I like to repay the kindness, Right? Then this kind of that mindset becomes very close to all sentient beings, right? So then wanted to repay the kindness becomes closer. And because of that close feeling, then the next one is love and kindness. Right? So love and kindness is the wish for all sentient beings towards abide in happiness. Yeah, so uh, this kind of wish arises as if beings are very close to us. And yeah, so we saw this dilemma often says when he meets a person, he says, oh, you know, I feel very close, like we met before, kind of thing. So that means that it's a kind of, this innate aspect of being close to sentient beings based on these trainings, right, over a long period of time. So, yeah, so that comes by the power of seeing the kindness, remembering the kindness, right, and try to repay the kindness. Yeah? And then after that, we generate this kind of love and kindness, the wish for them to abide in happiness. You see that? Yeah, so it's true. When people who are close to us, it's very easy to generate that wish, right? Yeah, so we generate ways for them to always abide in happiness. Yeah, so that's love and kindness. Yeah? So in Tibetan we say, Yidong Jamba. It's Yidong, it appears pleasant.
to one's mind. So being disappears in a pleasant way. And then, uh, if you, if they've been a pleasant way, you really want to help, right? So that's why uh, it's been, the term is there. Yeah? So means they will send you beings about your happiness. Okay? Then the next one is focusing upon what we talked about yesterday and before the break, the suffering, right? And how suffering is caused. Yeah? So seeing that others are in the same kind of boat as we are in, also they experience suffering and they also by the power of karma and afflictions. Right? So we generate a kind of wish for them to be free of suffering, which we define as uh, compassion. Yeah? So compassion is the wish for others to be free of suffering. Yeah, you see that? Yeah. So that's uh, yeah, compassion we generate it. Yeah, you can see. So now you get involved with sentient beings around you. First you generate a close kind of relationship with them, by like equanimity, remembering the kindness, or seeing them as your father and mother, right? First of all, people who were kind to you in all those previous lifetimes without beginning. Yeah, because our consciousness, basically, we cannot pinpoint down a beginning of consciousness. Consciousness is not matter, right? And consciousness can only be produced by a previous moment of consciousness. So uh, it's kind of a stream of moments, right? So every moment is because by its previous moment, by its previous, 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 previous. previous. So we cannot find a beginning. Yeah? So that's why uh, we also prove, from that point of view, and say with reincarnation theories of children remembering previous lifetimes, consciousness doesn't depend on the brain. There are types of consciousness that doesn't depend on the brain. Of course, our sensory perceptions, right? The things we hear, see, hear, taste, smell, touch, those are very coarser forms of consciousness which have direct uh, relation with brain activity. Right? Mental consciousness, the sixth type of consciousness, also has a connection with brain activity on the coarser level, but the subtler it becomes less uh, dependence. Right? So that's a few things to be known. Yeah? So, that goes there since beginner's lifetime. So since beginner's lifetime, we have got people who do care. So that's the, that kind of reasoning. That based on that logic, we say there's not even one person who has not helped us. Right? There's not even one sentient being like that. So we include all sentient beings. That way. You see that? Yeah. Then remember the kindness, then repay the kindness, then love and kindness of the towards about the happiness, and then uh, a wish for them to be free of suffering. Right? So that's Compassion. So then we, we talked about three levels, right? How wonderful it would be if they're free of suffering. May they be free of suffering. And how it cause them to be free of suffering. Right? So the last one is, as we call, special intention. Yeah, so after generating equanimity, seeing all sentient beings as your mother or father, or people who took care, remembering the kindness, repay the kindness, loving uh, kindness, right? And then compassion. Right? Then the next step is the special intention, a special kind of attitude that thinks, oh, I'm going to take responsibility. You know? So that's uh, what you try to generate in your mind, a kind of responsible feeling, I'm going to do this, I'm going to help sentient beings. You know? So that's this special intention. That's also venturing, isn't it? Huh? That's also venturing? Not yet, no, because uh, if you have this kind of commitment, Right, I want to liberate all sentient beings. Is a cause, right? Is a sixth among the, the, the six cause and effect. So we have seven cause and effect methods. There are six causes and one effect, right? So the effects for each other. So this kind of special intention is the main cause for what each other come about. Yeah? So based on this intention, I'm going to liberate all sentient beings from the suffering. Then we're going to check. Can I do that right now? Do I have the capacity to do that or not? Right. And then we will come to the conclusion that we need a certain amount of mental development to be able to do that. Right. So then we think if we can become a Buddha, for a Buddhist practitioner, right? You think if you become a Buddha, I can do really can be a real benefit. Or you think about a person like this Holmes Dalai Lama, something like that, what a person like that can do for human society and what we can do for human society. There's a difference, right? So if you develop your mind in a very constructive way, then there's a possibility to do something. Right? So then you think, oh, I need to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Right? So then you generate what is called bodhicitta. Because bodhicitta has two aspirations. You know? One aspiration 
is this kind of, I have to become a Buddha, right? There's a resultant aspiration. Yeah? I have to become a Buddha. Why? In order to liberate sentient beings from their suffering. And to liberate sentient beings from their suffering is a causal aspiration. You see that? Yeah? So, a causal aspiration and a resultant aspiration. And then, by depending you know, on this kind of motivation, we generate this bodhicitta, right? So, I want to become a Buddha. Why? In order to liberate sentient beings from their suffering. Right? That's more or less the mind of bodhicitta. Body means enlightenment, chit, bodhicitta means mind, right? Mind of enlightenment. So you can see there's a process needed to come to that mind. Yeah? So with this equanimity, seeing how kind sentient beings are, repay their kindness, wish to repay their kindness, love and kindness, compassion, special intention, and then this bodhicitta is generated. You see that? Yeah? So then, to generate, the stronger the compassion is, the stronger the bodhicitta becomes. Right? Because the more we understand the suffering of others, the more the wish comes <coughs> to liberate them and for that purpose achieve enlightenment. So then, this, this compassion, uh, also with regard to emptiness, if you have understanding of emptiness, that compassion becomes stronger. You know, there's uh, also three levels of compassion. One level of compassion is just thinking about the suffering of others and the wish for others to be free of suffering. And then the next level of compassion is having understood subtle impermanence that we are momentary changing and that things around us are momentary changing. Sentient beings are momentary changing. And every single moment they are suffering. Right? So every single moment they are suffering and we have to do something about it. You know? So that's kind of the compassion. The second one of having realized subtle impermanence. Yeah. Then the third level of compassion is a compassion that's even stronger, a compassion that is in the mind of a person who has realized emptiness. Because if you realize emptiness, you know you know what is ignorance, and you know it's possible to eliminate ignorance, right? So that means, uh, if you understand how to eliminate ignorance for yourself, then also you understand how to eliminate ignorance for others. Yeah. So then, this becomes a very profound aspect, very sophisticated, because you see, beings are suffering, and you know why, and you know how to do something about it, you see. So that becomes a very constructive way of thinking, that's why. Compassion, uh, in this context, has been very well researched, that is a very constructive state of mind, because it's kind of, the clarity is there, analyzes, understands the issues, and knows how to do something about it. So that's why, when I mentioned yesterday, uh, certain scientists, uh, you know, like like Eve Ekman, who did his research, empathy versus compassion, and seeing that empathy only feeling the suffering of others is not enough. Yeah, that causes burnout, stress, uh, you know, depression. But if you have a compassion that is a constructive way of thinking, I'm going to do something about it. That mind has so much clarity and solving the problems. The potential is there. So then there is much less burnout or stress in the healthcare as he examined. So this compassion training is kind of a very constructive way in helping others. And so uh, as we said yesterday also as Holy Dalai Lama says if you want to be selfish, be selfish in an intelligent way. You know? So <laughs> if you be selfish and you only think about yourself, then you won't achieve much happiness. But if you're selfish in a way you think about others and generate compassion, love and kindness, then automatically you yourself will also experience uh, kind of, you know, uh, some, some satisfaction in life, and some happiness in life, right? So that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of being clever in a way how to uh, take care of self and others. And so uh, in that regard, it's very important to understand this aspect of compassion training in order to not only help others, but automatically one will benefit as well, right? So that's, yeah. If you have a long-term goal, then these things, yeah, bring great benefits. You know? so, yeah, so that's why this compassion, training in these ways of using the understanding of emptiness to prove uh, the possibility of eliminating ignorance for others becomes a very constructive way of understanding what is the issue, what is the problem, and how to go about it. Yeah, so that can be done. But also, other insights can be of great help, right? If another, person's, another person irritates you, says something nasty to you, you know the person is not the issue. But the mind in the person, that's the problem, right? 
So in the mind of that person, there's maybe anger or aversion that causes the person to be stirred up and say something to you. But deep inside, the person doesn't like this. But it's just overpowered, like an emotional hijack. There's no control. But deep inside, doesn't like it. So the same thing will happen to you, you know, when I was walking in London uh, for the first time. Uh, because I'm, you know, I'm dressed slightly different than a common man on the street. <laughs> you know? So uh, my friends in the monastery, one of the first questions they ask me, how is it in London to walk around on the street? Because we monks, we, we, monks, we talk like that. You know? so, uh, so then, because it's a very multicultural city, so it's very easy. You get a lot of positive comments. Only people who are drunk or people who are you know, abused by different types of drugs, they give sometimes nasty comments. So then you say, it doesn't matter, this person is drunk. You know, this person is kind of, uh, you know, on the influence of a certain substance, so that's why they say that. You know? So the same thing happens to us when uh, people say something unpleasant to us. I think the battery is flat, maybe. to us, we say, oh, this doesn't matter, this person is drunk, right? So in a similar way, a person who is overpowered or influenced by a substance, you know, says something to us, we say, oh, it doesn't matter. But in a similar way, a person who is not in control over the afflictions and is overpowered by this affliction, the same thing, he was kind of drunk, not in control because of this affliction, and says something nasty to us, right? So, of course, we shouldn't we can still say something to an individual, but we should know the real cause of the problem, that's the issue. You know, that's understanding what is the root cause of the problem. Yeah, and of course, we can be very direct, as we discussed yesterday, with a mind in, in, in a peaceful kind of neutral state, yeah, practicing patience, we can still be very direct with the individual. You know? Even use kind of direct language, but not motivated with irritation or, touch or, or aversion. Because if irritation or aversion takes over, then we lose the clarity of the mind and we might say the wrong things. Yeah, so it's very important to think clearly and say the right things at the right time for a particular purpose. It's constructive thinking and constructive kind of moving forward. Yeah, so that's another aspect you can think about uh, while practicing compassion for others, right? So, yeah. so that's a few things I thought I uh, wanted to share. Yeah. Any questions regarding these points or emptiness or okay. So um, in terms of understanding, I think a lot of people understand mm -hmm. where they have to uh, go in terms of uh, compassion. Mm -hmm. But uh, as we have to habituate ourselves, yeah. as you said, <coughs> it, it can be a very time consuming thing. Yeah. Um, in terms of activities or in terms of doing mm -hmm. that or practicing that. What are the activities or steps, if you can? Uh, mm. I think that will help people to get to that level. Yeah. From um, level one, two, three. Of course, it's kind of it's a very integrated. It's a process, right? Yeah. So that means that, but the main thing is we have to do mental training because all our physical and verbal activities are influenced in the way we think, right? So that's why it's very important to get clarity about our mental training. Because if from the from your own point of view of your mind there's stability and control, right? So we talk about in psychology of self-awareness, self-discipline, right? And then only after that empathy and compassion can come. Right? So that means like a criminal, most of the, of the criminals they don't have a real understanding of what's going on in their own mind, their own feelings. They're not aware of that. So they don't understand that of others as well. So that's why these kind of teachings or these instructions, like that's why emotional intelligence, you know, Daniel Coleman's kind of projects in the US it seems to be very successful. Because if you understand your own mind, you will understand the mind of others, right? So same in this uh, research with, uh, with 
with the mind of a leader, same thing. If you understand your own mind, you understand the mind of others. Right? So that means, if you know how to subdue your mind, you know how to relate to others. So the first step is this kind of yeah, self-awareness, you know, self-discipline, and then only we can do things constructively in our actions as well. You see? Yeah, so no, I was talking more in terms of steps, like for example you said, we need to get closer to things. I don't want, yeah. For example, uh, I can be seated in a room and read meditation and all of that, and yeah. bring uh, self-awareness from yeah. that, and also by uh, knowledge, by yeah. reading about it, where my mm. ignorance is going. Yeah. But I could probably enhance that by, say, uh, spending too much time in nature, or, I or visiting to a zoo where I can see the animals, or probably going to hospitals where I can yeah. see people, and then yeah. you know my journey can be enhanced, yeah. right? So I'm yeah. talking about you know some something understanding like the suffering of others, basically, yeah. right? Yeah, because today in today's time, people ask that yeah. okay, how can I get there? Yeah. Get, yeah. And how uh, is something that you know we leave it to people. Yeah. Uh, there are there are other yeah. things where people yeah. say that go and do this and you get that. They have yeah. defined the steps, yeah. right, in terms of an activity. Yeah. 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 So, you know, something like that will really Yeah, you have to, basically, we have to try to work on two levels, right? Mm -hmm. So, temporary and ultimate. Mm -hmm. So, on temporary level, we like to, to help others in, in society. Mm -hmm. Whatever needs they need, they, they need, right? Then, on an ultimate level, we try to influence their minds. Mm -hmm. So, that's the same through. In, in many projects, we're very successful. I was quite impressed with Halben Prison. Norway. It's one prison where they uh, teach the inmates a very uncommon way of the guards, I'm not being called guards, but guides, the guides of and they do a lot of yoga and, and uh, daily activities. And so what they do in, in this prison, they treat the inmates as human beings, right, as friends. And because even the worst criminal can change their mind. You know? So they do all kinds of activities which helps them to improve their breaking the cycle of being you know, in a negative state of mind. So they break the cycle by doing exercises, and yoga, and different workshops they do, you know. And then they also try to influence the mind a little bit of positive thinking, you know. So they come to, the people who come out of that prison, there's only 20% who fall back to old habits of criminality. Well, in the UK, it's like 50% to 60%. And the U.S. is 17 to 80, because it's just a lock-up system. It's not. It's not going to improve their behavior, right? It's just getting off the street. That's it. But they will go back in the same patterns. You know? So, so that means you have to do temporary and ultimate goals, right? Temporary, you give them the right conditions, and ultimately you try to change their minds. Right? Yeah. So we have to. Oh, yeah, almost done. Yeah. <laughs> so I understood yeah. that the, yeah. this is just an extension yeah. uh, to courageous compassion that you spoke yeah. about the third level. Yeah. Um, is there something beyond that in terms of uh, uh, affecting mm -hmm. the, the larger uh, population of the sentient beings? How quickly we can bring, bring them? You know, because yeah. that will need skill, that will need yeah. technology. Yeah. Uh, if you talk about uh, the recent sea learning. Yeah. That has been yeah. 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 We, are, we are looking at structural changes, yeah. we are looking at how quickly we can get it in the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. So that will need a different scale than yeah. just True. That meditation. Yeah. yeah, but it's based on these kind of principles, right? So of course, a lot of other projects have to be done, right? With, with this kind of social emotional learning, you yeah. know, together with ethics, you know, there's many of these projects happening. Compassion, constructive compassion training. Yeah. So, on the different platforms, in combination with universities, we can slowly build these kind of platforms and then make a bigger kind of influence in society. Right? Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Actually, you just spoke about this prison in Norway. Yeah. This first started in India in one of the most notorious central jails of Delhi, Bihar. Yeah. Where our first group of IPs officers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard about it. Yeah. And he must have heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is like five times the mm. capacity yeah. of population of inmates are there. And she started this program on yoga and meditation, yeah. Yeah. which has been a great help yeah. also to the yeah. inmates. Yeah, it's very important. And then people can change, right? Yeah. 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 So, Keshila,
question. I just wanted to uh, talk about one incident. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine actually works with the juveniles in the prison in Norway. She's Norwegian. And she was talking about this boy, mm -hmm. high risk youth, who <laughs> tried to escape mm -hmm. and run. And the guide mm -hmm. ran behind him <laughs> yeah. for, for as long as he wanted to yeah. run to escape. Yeah. The guide ran behind him without touching him, without hitting him just following him yeah. and uh, then when he got tired and emotionally spent then they got they chatted and then he came back okay. to finish so that yeah. was one thing yeah. second thing i have a question Geshla. Mm. Um, conventionally we say that uh, the compassion of a parent is one of the highest compassions mm -hmm. that you can find in mm -hmm. especially in our culture how different is the compassion of a mother or a father from the compassion of a good, of good uh, uh, no comparison. Yeah. No comparison. Because uh, our compassion or love and kindness for our own children is mixed with attachment, right? So that means if your child does something to the, the child of the neighbor and the neighbor child starts to fight your child, you will still try to protect your own child, right? So that means it's mixed with attachment. It's not a universal because this equanimity is not there. See that? So that means the Buddha doesn't make a distinction between those who are close or those who are distant or those who benefit or harm him, right? He will help on an equal level. Yeah. So that's, yeah, because that's a genuine form without attachment. Yeah? So it's not really compassion then? It's, it has an aspect of compassion and of unkindness, but it's mixed. It's not really in a pure form as such. It has good qualities as well, but it also can cause some issues, right? Mm -hmm. Because it makes you attachment. Can we say that it is, you don't want your children to suffer? At the same time, it yeah, yeah. also relates with an aspect of selfishness. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But when you have to make a judgment between your own children and the, the children of the neighbor when they have an issue, then you will easily take your the position of protecting your own ones, right? Well, they may be really the cause of the problem. See? That would also be tainted by the fact that you know you expect something from them in return in your own age. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's an aspect of gain there. Yeah. 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 In fact, yes. in, yes. in, yeah. Yeah. in yeah. fact, Mishra, uh, yes. the different cultures. For instance, I had a friend of mine. Yeah. In, in Dutch party, who went to do a PhD in Germany. Mm. A couple of years he came back and he said. Oh, we expect our children to look after. I will not expect my children to look after me. I do, yes. So it's a very cultural model. Yeah, it's cultural. In the Indian context, True. even now here in India, people are getting used yeah. to the fact that their children are not getting yeah. to them. Yeah. And also, I have my own siblings, mm. three siblings, each with one child, yeah. all of them in the US. Yeah. So, I mean, they can't look after their parents. Yeah, yeah it's a different kind of. Of course, one parent yeah. is quite active. Mm -hmm. that how we can influence them 
that is uh, that is my question. Ali, because yes. the person we cannot directly influence them. Yeah. Go and take the training from uh, yeah. someone. <laughs> it's true. So we, we cannot change the world, right? Yes. But we can show good example. It's the minimum we can do, you know, because otherwise we cannot push. If people are not interested, we cannot push them. You know, only when they're interested and they're open with a, you know, a question or something like that, we can discuss, right? No, no, we actually just not having even chance to, you know, um, have interaction afterwards. Yeah. So we used to see people in bars or in yeah, yeah, yeah. places. We have some interaction, and yeah. after that we will move. We move move somewhere more. else. Yeah. yeah. So, but we think about that incident always. Yeah. And we may not meet that person again, right? Really? So, but we try to generate our compassion in our mind to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but how we can help that person? Mm -hmm. I mean, how this compassion help the person? Yeah. So uh, it helps. Although we have we have been talking about long term planning, right? So there's two aspects to that. You know? Compassion helps you on your individual level in, in you know, thinking more constructively, right? And on the long term, if you generate compassion, it's a cause for bodhicitta, and bodhicitta is a cause for enlightenment. Right? So, on the long term, the person will benefit having a connection with you now, and then later on, when you achieve enlightenment, you can help that person much, much better. Right? Yeah, so, that's, long, yeah, that's from a Buddhist perspective, we think about long term planning, which goes beyond a few lifetimes. Right? So yeah, the picture is a bit kind of faster. So we have to adjust with that person. <laughs> Say again? We have to adjust with, with that kind of person. Yeah, I mean, for that at that time, you could also shout at the person and then you harm that person, right? Yes. So now you didn't harm the person, so there's already benefit right there. You see? Yes. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, okay. So then we stop. Yeah, so make it kind of dedication. Uh, yeah, just uh, I do the prayers and you think. <laughs> 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 it's easier. You don't have to worry about what to read. <laughs> you just think that, uh, yeah, what we discussed yesterday, today, very precious, discussing emptiness and, and compassion. You know. and yeah, there's uh, so many people in this world who think about those things uh, on a regular basis, so it's very precious to be able to do that uh, because it is the real cause for happiness for some others. Yeah, so try to dedicate uh, these teachings or these kind of understandings. Uh, they will be understood by all sentient beings without exception and spread in all directions. Yes, dedicate for that. Dagging in some way, you are the dead on the work in the number. Keva just on those on the body, they will be more in the surgery. And then also try to think that uh, all the teachers, like the Zoni Zalam, Malam Zobrushi, all the great masters, uh, may all their uh, holy lives be long and stable and all the holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And make all the activities uh, come about without any obstacles. Kare rabe kore singam sava penda deva mahare vision bhani. Chhere zig mantan zangya zami chape chete bhati utam kya achi. And then also try to think that once all sentient beings generate these understandings of renunciation, renunciation, the wish for liberation, uh, bodhicitta. Yes, we just discussed loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta. And then the correct understanding of emptiness, so then once all sentient beings get a correct understanding of these points and quickly progress in the stage of the path to enlightenment. Nejon Samba, Limbo, Je, Magye, Pana, Gyeguji, Kyabai, Namba, Meba, Yangone, Kondo, Baba, Shon, Chanjo, Senjo, Limbo, Je, Magye, Pana, Gyeguji, Kyabai, Namba, Meba, Yangone, Kondo,